lecture of uh, 2018. Um, today we're going to have Tracy Nolan presenting on plastic pollution in the oceans. Uh, very quickly, before we get started, just a couple things. Um, if you have a phone, please put it to vibrate. Um, if you have any questions, try to save them to the end, just so that we can kind of flow through the presentation better. Um, also, one quick announcement I want to make. Um, for those of you who know, uh, NOAA has a headquarters, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration. Uh, they have headquarters right here on Virginia Key, right across the street from um, Rasmus. Yeah, sorry, that way. Um, <laughs> Uh, I'm directionally challenged. Um, <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, so right across the street from Rasmus, and they work very, very closely uh, with the Marine School for all kinds of research, PhD, um, PhD students, master's students. Um, there's CMIS, the Cooperative Institute for Marine and Atmospheric Science at Rasmus that um, a lot of what they do works with NOAA. And they're considering moving their headquarters to St. Petersburg, and we don't want them to. Um, if you're interested, uh, the village just passed a resolution on Tuesday to uh, help as far as like we want to be involved in trying to convince them to stay and getting our citizens involved in helping them um, to decide to stay here instead of moving. Um, so if anybody's interested, I have copies of the resolution. Just come grab me and uh, I'll, I'll <laughs> and, and then we'll um, you know then you can, you can see what they're what they're talking about and what what we're worried about happening. So. Now that that's out of the way, without further ado, I'll um, introduce Tracy Nolan with Debris Free Oceans. Um, I will be turning off all the lights in here, but we have the back room open, so it shouldn't be too dark. And uh, like I said, um, if you want a copy of this, just come find me after the presentation. Tracy. Thank you so much for coming. I uh, really appreciate it. I'd love to talk about my passion, which is plastic in the ocean. Um, before I get started, a couple of things. One. I see a lot of students here. I know you probably don't want to talk about anything, but <laughs> anyone, if, do you guys know anything about plastic in the ocean or plastic pollution at all? Have you like heard anything about it? The grapevine, you know anything? Or anything you want to share with me that you know? You don't have to, it's okay. I, I, I hated talking when I was a kid. There's a plastic island. Okay, I'm actually really glad you said that. Plastic island. So you guys have heard of the North Pacific uh, or like the Great Pacific Garbage Patch? So yeah, that's the most well-known plastic sort of island or plastic patch documented in the ocean. It's actually not an island. It's more like, um, like almost like a plastic soup in the water. So you could be sailing through it and going, and you might not even see stuff. If you took a cup of water and took like an actual sample, it'd be like all tiny bits of microplastics floating like a plastic soup. So in parts of the ocean like that, there's like a 40 to 1 ratio of plastic to plankton. But most people think of it like a garbage dump, like an island where plastic is kind of piling up. But it's actually, yeah, it's more like where it's just congregated there and it's breaking down to more like a plastic soup. But, you know, people think about that, which I'm glad I could actually, you know, kind of clarify that too. In Miami, though, we have a lot of places which pretty much are like plastic island. Not cool at all. Um, and then secondly, we have some extra Debris Free Ocean Zero Waste Toolkits that we have left over from that presentation we did earlier. So if you guys, do you guys ever, anyone go on the internet, use your phone, anyone, or at all at home? We have these surveys that we have on our website, which is debrisfreeoceans.org, and there's pre-lecture surveys and post-lecture surveys. So if anyone wants to take those surveys online, they're literally like five seconds or five easy questions, like yes or no, um, you can actually get a free Zero Waste Toolkit, and I'll show, what, I'll show you what they look like. Um, and if, if you can't do it, it's fine. We, we kind of want to give it out to the word, but they're pretty much a reusable water bottle, cutlery, and a, and a reusable bag that you can get for taking those surveys. Who can tell me what this is we're looking at right here? The Milky Way Galaxy. Who can give me an estimate of how many stars you think are in the Milky Way Galaxy? It's actually billions. So they say anywhere from 100 billion to 400 billion. So let's say we're talking with 400 billion, right? There's 13 times more plastic in the ocean than there are stars in the Milky Way galaxy. And this study was done in 2014, so now it's 2018. So imagine the plastic we have since 2014 with an estimated uh, garbage truckload of plastic entering the ocean every single minute of every day, right? So this, this study was done in 2014, 2018. Imagine how much plastic is now in the ocean since then. So it was 5.2 trillion pieces, and they, even, they, they estimated then this was an underestimate of how much plastic is actually in the ocean. So let's just say we have billions and trillions of pieces entering the, or plastic, plastic floating in the ocean with, again, a garbage circle of plastic entering every single minute of every single day. So where does, what is plastic and where does it come from? Plastic is essentially, your kids, you guys want to tell me, anyone know what this is right here? Uh, oil. 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 So plastic is actually a byproduct of oil. 
So after World War II ended in the late 1940s, early 50s, they had all these factories where they used to create uh, sort of uh, warfare with plastic. And they weren't actually using plastic then as what we use it for today. But when the, when the war ended, they were like, okay, what do we use these factories for? And they thought about it and they're like, okay, well, why don't we use, use these factories to create everyday items that we use, like cups and bags and you know, combs and hair combs. Because back then they were, they were actually using things like ivory or turtle shells to make some of the everyday items that we use, which obviously you couldn't mass produce in a scale that we, like we mass produce today, right? So the 1950s was really when the plastic became a part of daily life, which in reality, if you think of like the scale of human time, is the 1950s really that long ago? No. No, no like not, not as, a, as opposed to like how long humans have been around, the 1950s is really not that long ago, right? <laughs> like it's a long time ago, but it's not that long ago. Okay, good, thanks, but. So, here, guys, this is sort of a timeline of the plastics, sort of how plastics came to be in society. And Life Magazine, which is actually now Time Magazine, you guys know Time Magazine? Yes. So Time Magazine used to be Life Magazine. So in 1955, this was a cover of Life Magazine kind of glorifying this new way of life. Like, oh my gosh, I don't have to do dishes. I can literally get everything as plastic and throw everything away. It doesn't matter. Like, I literally can just get everything, toss it in the garbage. It was like this whole new way of life, a disposable, you know, on-the-go lifestyle where you could just chuck everything in the garbage. And it was amazing. I and mean, we could be the more, like, lazy and convenient on the go, right? And then here, you know, you can see, you can see 1962 was plastic bags were invented. And plastic bags weren't in grocery stores until 1977, which, again, Compared to how long we humans have been around and how long plastic's been around, you know, 1977 really isn't that long ago for how much plastic bags you see on a daily basis every now and then, right? So here's sort of a time, I know this, is, this graph is a little bit small, but this is here is 1950. So 1950, we had 1.5 million tons of plastic produced. This is 20, you can't really say it's 20, like 12 here, which is 288 million tons. They said for 2016, we had 320 million tons of plastic produced on a global scale, right? And then this is facts from 2013. We had 33 million tons of plastic waste that were created, right? Go to, go to the recycling bin. Only 9% of that plastic waste was actually recycled. 9% of 33 million tons. So, you know, we think of plastic waste, we always think of, okay, well, I can recycle it, and that's going to be the answer, and then I'll get rid of all my plastic trash. But if you look at this graph down here in the bottom, again, it's kind of hard to see, but this is, these are like the recycling rates over here. And the highest ones are things like batteries and yard waste. Down here, the lowest ones, this is bottles and like, you know, things like bottles and bags. So plastic has actually a really, really, really low recycle rate. And plastic actually has a really hard time being recycled over and over again. So again, focus on a few main items. So we pick straws, bags, and water bottles to kind of pick. But essentially, you can pick up, you know, there's many items you can pick up, but we kind of choose these three items. And up here, I know we say 29 billion plastic water bottles. It's actually 50 billion plastic water bottles. So the U.S. consumes 50 billion plastic water bottles every single year, every single year, just the United States alone, right? And the recycling rate for that is under 20%. So all those water bottles are going sent to a landfill or, again, probably ending, ending up in the ocean. Plastic bags, they say 100 billion plastic bags are used every year. They also say that every five seconds we use 60,000 plastic bags. So I always tell people, next time you go to the grocery store and you're waiting in line, right, like watch how many plastic bags are being given out just in the couple minutes that you're there waiting in line. And think about you know, how many are given out at that store in just one day. Let's say it's Publix, right? Then think about the Publix all over Miami, every single Publix. Then think about the Publix all over Florida. And then think about all the stores all over the world, like CVS, Walmart, Target, Home Goods, Home Depot, like all the grocery stores that are giving out plastic bags just in one day all over the United States. That's a ton of plastic bags, right? And that's just plastic bags, right? Think about plastic straws. 500 million plastic straws are used every single day, which is enough to fill 127 school buses alone. So if you think about all the plastic that adds up, and you know, I think as one person, you think, oh, I well, know it's just one straw and one bag, what does it matter? But there's seven billion people on the planet using plastic, right? It's everywhere. So if you think about all these people using plastic, or think about just one community, think about Key Biscayne, and one day how much plastic Key Biscayne goes through in one day, right? That's a lot of plastic. So we focus on plastic essentially because marine debris or plastic trash in the ocean, that's pretty much the majority of trash that we're going to see in the ocean is all plastic, right? You can see metal, you can see tires, you can see things like that, but really the focus, you know, 60 to 80 percent of trash in the ocean is plastic. That is because it does not biodegrade. So I always tell kids, you know, you can throw out a banana peel or an orange peel, not that I'm saying to do so, but you can throw it out, you know, in the woods or in the soil and, you know, eventually over time it'll become part of, you know, nature again, right, the earth. But will plastic do that? No, plastic is a man-made, you know, even though it comes from oil, they still add thousands and thousands of chemicals to it to kind of create a product that we have. They say that one piece of plastic can contain about, about like 8,000 different chemicals and additives just to make one piece of plastic that we actually use. So when we use plastic and we throw it out in the garbage or we throw it in the soil, it's literally never, ever, ever going to go away. So think about like a straw, right? I always said, think about one straw that you use. That one straw is going to be on this land or on this earth for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. Just one straw that you used one time. 
right? So this is kind of the issue we're having is that plastic never goes away and we use so much of it every single day. So imagine, could you guys go a day without using plastic? Like imagine a day. Could you go a day, or like without thinking about it, could you go a day without using plastic? Like if you really, really, really tried, you could. But is it easy? If you want to continue living a life that you know you ever want, no, it's not that easy because it's literally everywhere, right? So whenever I ask you know, kids who come to the beach, I say, where did this plastic come from? Most say, oh, people left it here, they littered. But in reality, 80% of that trash you're seeing on the beach actually has come from a land-based source, meaning it was either litter on land or it was in a garbage dump, it was an overflowing garbage truck, an overflowing garbage can, and it pretty much made its way from land to the sea by the wind. So have you guys ever seen these like storm drains like in the road? Yeah. So all those storm drains, they capture all the trash that has been on land, like littering on land, they all blow into the storm drains and all those storm drains, where do they lead? Out into the ocean or even in our case, out to Biscayne Bay. I'm sure, and then here you can see the United States, that is a map of all the rivers and streams in the US. It's like, it's like the arteries of the US, right? Where do all those rivers and streams lead to? Ocean, right? So essentially, trash from thousands of miles inland can actually travel all the way down to our ocean, all right, out to the ocean here. So you know, we don't, even without thinking about it, our trash, we have no idea where it's gonna end up. And whenever we say it, we're gonna throw it away, we're gonna put it away, like there really is no away, right? Away means, oh, we're just gonna put it to some other place on land or a garbage dump that we've allocated to, put, to take all of our trash, essentially, right? And you know, Miami, have you guys ever seen the garbage dump downtown, or not downtown, sorry, down south by, um, by Biscay National Park or by Homestead, Black Point Marina? They call it Mount Trash more, say it's the only mountain in Miami. It's huge. It's absolutely huge and it's just full of our trash because there's just nowhere to put it, right? And, there's, and you know, we had an article a few years ago saying that all the landfills in Miami would be full by 2017. Not sure what's happening with that now, but you know, it's, it is definitely a problem because think about the trash we create on a daily basis. There's so much plastic and so much trash. So when we say that plastic doesn't biodegrade, what happens is that it photodegrades or mechanical degradation. So that means that it actually breaks up. We don't say it breaks down, it breaks up into these tiny, tiny, tiny little pieces called microplastics, which is kind of, I was telling you guys earlier about the, um, the, art, the island of trash, right? It's more like microplastics, right? And what happens is they travel all over the currents in these gyres. When they end up in the gyre, that's where the currents slow down. It's almost like really, really slow whirlpool and trash gets stuck in there. And it can float in there for years and years and years. And if, it, you know, if the wind shifts, the wind changes, then, then that's when they can actually be blown out of it and they can wash back to shore, which is why places like Hawaii actually get so much of the microplastic pollution because they're really, really close to that gyre, um, things like that. But they can also travel all around the world. Like, you know, here in Miami, we get trash from all over the world. I did a beach cleanup a few months ago. We got trash from 10 different countries in about 50 feet on Elliott Key and, Key, and uh, Biscay National Park, 10 different countries. So you can see how far trash travels. So microplastics. Have you guys ever heard of the microbeads like in your face wash and your like lotion? So that picture down there is a little kits full of microbeads. They're like almost like particles of sand. They're so small that they actually go out of the wastewater treatment system and out into the ocean. So there's a thing that we do here called the Florida Microplastics Awareness Project with Sea Grant. We take samples of water and they test them under a microscope and see what we can find. And in those, a lot of those samples, we actually find those microbeads that are so, that are so small that come from our face wash and toothpaste. We're also finding microfibers. Have you guys ever heard of microfibers? Pretty much comes from our clothes. So a lot of our clothes are synthetic and they're a form of plastic. So when we wash our clothes, it's like, it's like 200,000 fibers per load come off of our clothes and then go into the ocean. And it's, it's like such a new thing that we actually don't know how, what the harm is causing on wildlife yet, but it's, we're pretty much finding it in every single one of our samples in the water samples here, microfibers. And then here, this is actually a sample from Crandon Beach. Um, right up against one of those little walls, like further up the beach where the high tides have come. And I've actually just took a scoop of sand. And this is all broken down pieces of little microplastics here. And then lastly, this picture over there looks like little eggs. Have you guys ever broken like a, like a bean bag or a bean baby and you see those little like pieces of plastic inside of those? Yes. Yeah, those are called nurdles. Because we, you can say like, remind of like nerdy turtles. That's kind of how I tell kids to remember it. So nurdles, those are virgin plastic pellets. So those are shipped to containers all over the world and then melted down and molded into things like plastic bags, toothbrushes, like everything plastic comes from nurdles. So we find those on the beach everywhere. Literally every single time I go to the beach, I'll find a nurdle. So next time you guys go to the beach, you can dig around the sand and you find like a tiny little plastic white pellet, that's gonna be a nurdle. And the fact that we're finding those on our beaches should be an indicator of how big the problem is. Like that hasn't even been turned into a plastic item yet and we're finding them all over our beaches, which is a huge problem. And I'm not really gonna get into this trash here, but even here, this is, this is an article from a couple years ago saying that these microplastics causes the US about $13 billion in damage to marine ecosystems every single year. And again, this is a little complicated, I'm not really gonna, gonna get into this as well, but plastic pellets, the smaller they are, the higher toxins are gonna actually like soak up like a sponge. So have you guys ever heard of DDT? 
I'm sure a lot, like the pesticide that was banned in the 70s, a really, really toxic pesticide that was actually banned in the 70s, but it still persists in ocean water and the seawater. So what happens is these toxic, like little pellets of plastic pieces, they soak up all these chemicals like a sponge and they magnify these toxins 100,000 times to a million times, right? So these, these, not only are these, these pieces bad for animals to eat, they're actually full of these toxic chemicals that animals are then gonna eat as well. So again, how is this plastic affecting our wildlife and marine ecosystems? So entanglement, <clears throat> a study a couple of years ago showed that, we, that sea or marine plastic is actually affecting over 700 different kinds of marine animals, right? So here you can see obviously fishing line, balloons, random pieces of plastic, you know, affecting all of our animals for entanglement. And ingestion is a really, really huge thing. And I said that because there's a couple of new studies that came out recently that are really, really interesting. So I'm gonna start with this one, fish mistaking plastic debris in ocean for food. So fish, so you know, some people say, oh, well, these animals are dumb. They're just eating plastic. They don't know what, you know, they don't know what it is. In reality, they're not dumb. Because what hap what's happening is the plastic, it's floating in the water for so long and breaking down in these pieces that algae, you guys know what algae is? Like it's almost like a, like a plant in the water. So it's starting to stick and grow on plastic pieces. Therefore, the algae actually emits these chemicals in the water that animals can smell and know that it's food. So the plastic is now literally smelling and presenting itself to be food and it's looking like food and smelling like food, so they're gonna eat it, right? So fish are now eating it, including seabirds are eating all this plastic because they literally think it's food. And corals, which we'll get there, are doing literally the exact same thing. And this picture down here in the bottom, right, all these little containers, of, a little uh, tiny pieces of plastic there in the containers, those are all from dead baby sea turtle stomachs in the Loggerhead Marine Life Center. So the turtles hatch here, like you guys know, I'm sure you guys will live here, the turtles hatch here in Key Biscayne in the summer, right? They all make their way out to the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, which we call the Sargasso Sea. It's full of all that sargasm seaweed that you can pop all the bubbles on it, right? And you can shake it out, the, the shrimp come in there. So in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean is a huge, huge, huge patches of that, right? And the baby turtles, they make their way out there and they spend about 10 or so years living out there as juveniles. What's happening is, it's again, it's one of those gyres I was talking about earlier. So plastic makes its way out of that area, breaks down into tiny pieces and the babies are all eating all these plastics and their bellies get so full of it that they pretty much starve themselves because it's, it's not food, it's not nutrients, and then they, they starve and they kind of they die and they wash back ashore and they call it washbacks. So then they dissect them and they find all these bits of plastic in their stomach. Again, up there, turtle with plastic in its stomach. Two seabirds, all that in their seabird stomach and then fish here as well. So it's a huge, huge <coughs> problem with animals eating it. And then effects on mangroves. I'm sure you guys have seen mangroves here. The plastic is almost daunting. You can't clean it up. I and mean, we've gone in there and this plastic literally inches deep into the soil. We cannot even clean it up. It's such a daunting task. So you can see here, you know, there hasn't really been studies done on how it's affecting mangroves, but you can imagine that if plastic, all these toxic plastic pieces are in the soils here, how is it affecting the growth of the trees? Is it creating toxins for the trees? Is it affecting the, you know, toxins for the animals who live there and depend on these places to, to survive? That's one question we can kind of ask ourselves for mangroves. Beaches, there's been studies shown on sea turtles that mama turtles who come onto the beaches and lay their eggs, if there's trash there, they can get stuck. Uh, they, may not even, they may even turn around and go away if there's too much trash there. And then the babies, when they hatch and there's trash on the beach, they've shown that if, like, let's say there's like a, cu a cup there, right? The baby will literally just headbutt the cup over and over again because like, they, don't, they can't really figure out a way to like, go around it. So they'll just like headbutt this trash and then it kind of causes them to die because they eventually just give up and they won't make their way to the beach. These pictures here, guys, is actually plastic pieces that coral, the coral polyps actually ingested. Because you know, are you guys familiar with coral reefs at all, how they feed? So a lot of them feed by photosynthesis, but many of them have these little tentacles they actually feed by grabbing food out of the water as well. So they did a study showing that they actually preferred plastic pieces to even like sand and rock pieces. Like they chose plastic as opposed to even actual food. So that you know the fact, so corals already face so many threats already from global warming, disease, and this is actually showing that they're literally choosing plastic to eat as well. And then plastic covered corals are creating more disease in corals because of the chemicals in the plastics as well. So it's a huge issue for, plastic, for corals. So essentially, what can we do to help this problem? What's going on and you know, what can we do? So the, the problem here is that we assume we have infinite resources, right? And then we assume we have infinite disposal, meaning that we assume we can just use as much as we want, there's no problem, and then you can just throw away as much as you want, and there's no problem, right? We kind of got to, we got to change that status quo here. So the solution, we have a five-step thing here, but really we focus on reduce, reuse, and recycle. And we really, really, really focus on the word reduce. So reduce meaning essentially use less plastic. You know, like you guys are the answer to this problem, essentially. And like, yes, we can definitely go to lawmakers. Like you guys don't keep a skein. You can 100% make a change here by going to your, you know, by city commissioners and creating separate restaurants and businesses to, you know, use less plastic. But you as an individual can also make a change. It's kind of like the domino effect, right? If you make a change and you start using less plastic and you start using reusable bags and reusable water bottles and reusable cutlery and saying no to straws, 
other people will notice that and they will take effect, right? They'll, they'll, listen, they'll listen to you and they'll make a change as well. I say once one person does it, then people will follow. It's like anything, right? So if you make a change, people will listen to you and people will follow you. So it's good for you to be an ambassador to kind of like make a change and help this problem. Because I mean, you guys all live here. I'm sure you see this trash when you go to the beach all the time. Or at least if you see it, now you kind of know what's, what the problem is and how big of an issue it is and what you guys can actually do to help it, right? So like we say, plastic bags. When you guys go to the store, bring your own reusable bag. Many cities and states all over the world have banned plastic bags because they're so bad for the environment. Like California, they ban plastic bags. Hawaii, they ban plastic bags. Many, many places in Europe, China, um, even like a place where I grew up in Rhode Island, they just ban plastic bags. Granted, it took like three years to do it, but it happened, right? So, you know, like, it's going to be hard. It's a fight, but you got to keep doing it. And while they're doing it, you know, make your own changes, like doing things like this. And then even later, you know, like straws, saying you know, the straw, bring your own reusable water bottle. I know everyone has this whole thing about using water bottles. Like they think water bottles are cleaner, it's better. And that's actually pretty false, is that over 50% of water bottles is actually just tap water. So you're essentially, you're just buying into a, you know, this kind of sort of scam where they're literally just bottling tap water and making you buy it. So all you can do is get a good filter, put it on your sink, get it in your fridge, get a Brita, and you can have clean water and you can save money and you can help the environment by not purchasing bottled water. So that's a really huge thing you guys can do as well. <clears throat> and then reuse. I always see kids, you know, at the nature center, they always bring everything in like Ziploc bags and things like that. Like Ziploc bags, you can reuse over and over and over again. I have the same like five Ziploc bags for the past like however many years. I just rinse them out, clean them, use them all over again. It's the same thing because literally they are, they will last forever. And all you have to do is rinse them out, use them again. There's literally no need to buy boxes and boxes and boxes and keep throwing out these bags, right? So reuse is a huge thing. If you have something that's plastic, reuse it, keep it, and wear it out to like this. You know, you officially cannot use it anymore. Actually, this, this picture right here is one of our founders. She used her old computer like case and she turned it into a cutting board because the, the tomato juices didn't drip off the sides. So, you know. And I said, get creative, right? And then recycle. So yes, recycling is definitely important, but it's not the answer. We kind of say recycling is more like a Band-Aid, right? So it's going to help the problem, but it's really not going to fix the problem. So this is Miami. This picture on the left there, that is the room where they take, or sorry, one of the rooms where they take all the stuff people put in the recycling and just put it aside to go back to the landfill or the dump, right? So essentially, the majority of the stuff, and they told us the majority of stuff that they get there just goes back right to the dump. Because A, people don't know how to recycle, they just, which is, it's hard, because you know, every city is different, everywhere you go is different, you never know what to recycle. So the majority of stuff people recycle actually just go right to the dump. This is us just looking at this huge, massive pile of, of trash here in the recycling facility that's just making their way to the dump. So it's important to know, you know what you can recycle and kind of to use it as a last resort. Don't just think that you can get as much plastic as you want and then recycling is going to be the answer because, oh, you're recycling it, so therefore it's, it's going to be fine, right? And just so you know, recycling in Miami, you can only recycle beverage bottles, detergent bottles, like shampoo bottles, and that's pretty much it. Or oh, cans and glass. But no plastic bags, no plastic cups, no plastic food containers, no plastic silverware, no straws, literally just bottles. Yeah, bottles, that's it, really. Bottles, cans, and glass. And cans, they have an 80% recycle rate. So you can recycle cans over and over and over and over again. Same with paper, right? Plastic, when you recycle one thing of plastic, it usually has a one-life like one thing. So you can put a bottle in recycling, and it can get recycled like once into something else, but that's it. So essentially, it's not even like a closed loop system because you can't even recycle it over and over and over again. It's just taking one thing. And plastic, you know, think about, again, how much plastic we use, it's like, again, not the answer, right? And then, again, just kind of like uh, supporting brands that are good for the environment. Like, like support brands that love to take trash and turn it into something that's cool. Or like here, if, if any of you guys like a skateboard, Vareo, they make skateboards out of fishing nets, discarded fishing nets in Chile. And they're all about the zero waste lifestyle. They have awesome t-shirts, bags, sunglasses, the whole thing. And they like, are all about this whole, you know, creating awareness and creating awesome skateboards from it as well. And then shoe, Indoso, they make shoes out of tires and bollies. So it's all about, you know, like being an aware consumer for what you purchase as well and knowing what, knowing what you buy. And then get involved, beach cleanups, tell your friends, tell your family, you know, just kind of like get the community involved and spread awareness throughout your, for, throughout everything, right? Like you guys, again, the Key Biscayne is a perfect place to actually do something because you have a small community surrounded by water. You guys can get businesses involved, you can get your school involved, you can create clubs. There's so many things you guys can do, like do your own beach cleanups. There's a million things you guys have at your fingertips ready to do. And also, if you guys are in school, I always say take this topic and create your own presentation out of it. Like do your own research, pick an issue, and teach it to all the you know, people at your school because then you, know, you never know what might happen if you actually do that, right? So it's definitely a good thing to get involved. <clears throat> and yeah, and I love this quote because it's kind of a long quote, but it says, many of us ask, what can I as one person do? But history shows us that everything good and bad starts because somebody does something or does not do something. So essentially, you're just one person. People think, oh, you can't make a difference. 
But you as one person can make a difference. You're one person, people will follow you if you make a difference. So don't think that you can't do something because you're just one person. Trust me, one person, like, like I said, everything in history has started because someone has done something or hasn't done something. So it's like, so do something and get out there and fight for it because you guys want to have disgusting dirty beaches or animals dying for plastic for the rest of your life? Doubtful, right? And also guys, think about it even in terms of like your own health and your own future. I mean, if all the animals in the ocean are eating it and we depend on seafood, all these animals are also consuming plastic and you're consuming them and they're eating this toxic plastic. So it's going right back up the food chain up to us as well. And think about, you know, even when we're using plastic, we're consuming all those toxic chemicals that are put into plastic and we eat and drink plastic, which is shown to be really, really, really harmful to our health. So it's all relatable back to us as well. So you guys can do a lot. Um, and I think that is pretty much uh, it. Oh, lastly, one thing, I always forget to talk about this, balloons, 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 balloons. <laughs> Never let balloons go ever let balloons go because balloons are one of the number one things we find on the beach all the time. It strangles birds. What do, what do you think a balloon looks like when it's floating in the water? What animal? A jellyfish, right? So turtles are constantly eating balloons thinking they're jellyfish all the time. Like literally almost every single dead turtle when they dissect them has a, has a balloon inside their belly because they think it's jellyfish. And people, you know, you don't realize that when we let something go, we think, oh, it's going to like go fly away. But what's the saying? What goes up must come down. So balloons, let them go. They're all going to come down, and unfortunately, they are such they cause like havoc. They wreak havoc on wildlife, and they're so 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 bad for the environment. So it's, you know, especially after Valentine's Day, I know it's like a huge balloon holiday. Really, really, really important for you guys to know. To you know, if you have balloons, never let them go. Or if you have a party or something, kind of think of something different you can use that's not balloons to you know get creative and you know to decor to be better to the environment. So um, so yeah. Any questions? <laughs> Tracy, yes. But I Oh, love it there. There is a, old, there is a woman in Concord who was at least as old as I am, if not older, older. who single-handedly, the town of Concord in Massachusetts outlawed plastic bottles. You Whoa. cannot buy juice bottles. You cannot buy water bottles from any of their stores in Concord. Really? That's she amazing. She to do this, and she did it all by herself. About a year ago. Only about a year ago. That's so, incredible. Yes, yeah, so if, you, if you persist at something, you can do it. That's incredible. Right. And like Whiskey Joe's and the uh, Rusty Pelican, they just started a whole new campaign called Miami's Not Plastic. They got rid of all their straws there, no more plastic cups, no more plastic like to-go containers. So like they're starting a whole thing. So it's like if you guys have like restaurants you like to go to here, try and get them on the straw thing. Even like you can get paper straws. And I know people always complain like, oh, they fall apart. But it's like it's still a better solution, right? It's better for the environment. And, that, and people always say, you know, it's like in places like where they've actually done it before, people say, you know, at first it's really hard because, you know, Everything is what you're used to. It's habit. You know, we're so used to going to the store and getting a plastic bag. Once you change that habit a little bit and you make a new habit, then that becomes like a new thing for you, right? It's like it's the new norm. So you get used to it. It may seem hard at first or something like a big change, but once you do it a lot, it becomes natural for you. Like I didn't, I wasn't always this way. Like I never even cared about it until I was older. And so I grew up, you know, using loads of plastic and drinking out of plastic bottles, using plastic bags. It wasn't until I was in my early 20s when I actually learned about this problem that I was like, oh my gosh, and I was blown away and I couldn't even believe it. And I didn't even work in marine science forever. You know, I used to work in fashion in New York City, and I learned about the environment and everything that was happening to it, like in animal rights and everything. And I was like, you know what? I'm quitting my job, and I'm traveling, and I'm doing more to learn. And that's when I did that, and I learned a lot more. And then I came, went to school here at the marine science campus right here on Key Biscayne, and I focus a lot on plastic pollution and education. So, you know, there's no saying. It's like you don't, you, you don't even have to be in marine science to even care about this stuff. You can do whatever you want and still care and, like, educate those around you. And it's like, yeah. And it's the more you try and the more you change, the more it becomes a natural habit for you. So, you know, it, yeah, even, like, people in D.C., they say, you know what, at first it was annoying, but now we're all used to bringing our bag to the store. So it's just like, we just, that's what we do. We just do it. And both towns I grew up in, in New York and in Rhode Island, they both ban plastic bags. So that, for me, is really exciting. So it's cool. <laughs>